Happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome to episode 50 of the Snyder Cut. What a milestone. Thank you guys for hanging in there with me. I truly appreciate you, you watching this podcast, listening to this podcast, consuming this podcast, however you may do it. Uh, man, I didn't think we'd get to 50. I thought I'd be taken off the air by then. Clyder would have just shown me the door. He just said, St- stick to writing, kid. Um, anyways, we've got a full show today, so let's dive in. Uh, let's start with the big comic book news of the week. Jonathan Majors from Lovecraft Country, from The Five Bloods. Guy's having a hell of a year. He has been cast as the villainous Kang the Conqueror in Ant-Man 3, or whatever they decide to call it, Ant-Man and the Wasp 2, Ant-Man and the Wasp something something. Who knows what this the, the title is going to be. All we know is that Peyton Reed is coming back to direct. Paul Rudd's back. It's Lang vs. Kang. And, and Evangeline Lilly will, of course, be there as well. Um, Jonathan Majors, uh, good actor. Good actor. Uh, I don't know if he's being, like, Deadline sort of intimated that Kang the Conqueror, that there's going to be some kind of twist in the way that he's presented to the audience in future films. Um, so I don't know if he, if he presents as a good guy who then becomes, you know, reveals himself to be a bad guy or, or presents as a bad guy who, you know, maybe can do some, some good in the world. I don't know. Um, I'm just really not that familiar with Kang the Conqueror and, and didn't read all, you know, as soon as, as soon as that comes out, it's like, well, who is Kang the Conqueror? You see those headlines across the internet. I didn't click on any of those. I didn't, I don't really know who the hell Kang the Conqueror is. Uh, he's got what? purple face is that it um Jonathan Majors this is this is a good get this is an up-and-coming uh black star he you know we did a story this week about the harder they fall and and, uh, that's like the the movie that Jay-Z is producing producing for Netflix it's going to be Jonathan Majors in a revenge movie against Idris Elba so like you know his star is only getting bigger I think it's smart for Marvel to get in early and yeah, I'm just very curious whether this is going to be a sort of one-off for him or if they're positioning Kang as like the next Thanos in the MCU. Um, Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country, I, I, I do want to continue watching. I only watched that first episode and I was kind of mixed on it. And then what I heard from the rest of my Collider colleagues, they kind of felt like you know, the show didn't know what it wanted to be. So I haven't dived into the rest of those episodes um, but I, but I am intrigued, and, and I certainly know people who who are really enjoying Lovecraft Country. Uh, I really liked Jonathan Majors in The Last Black Man in San, in San Francisco. I thought um, I gravitated towards his character more than Jimmy Fail's character in that movie. And uh, yeah, you know he's um, he's he's interesting. He, he was supposed to be in Trial of the Chicago Seven, so Sorkin cast him, but then had to replace him with uh, Yaya Abdul Mateen. Uh, I don't know if that was a, a Lovecraft Country, you know, scheduling issue or something like that. Uh, I also liked, what did I see him in? It was that Rupert Wyatt, Cap, Captive State, I want to say it was. He was he was okay in that. Like, Jonathan, he's got something. He, he's got a certain gravitas, a certain charisma. And he was good in Defy Bloods, too. I mean, it's him and a bunch of older co-stars, really. And he totally held his own against those guys. We're going to talk about that movie a little bit more uh, later in the show. So, Jonathan Majors as Ant-Man 3 villain. I dig it. I'm I'm into it. Nice job, Marvel. Um, Harry Styles. Speaking of Marvel, this was an interesting one. So uh, Justin Kroll dropped the, the bombshell. 17,000 likes for my boy Kroll on Twitter on this story. Harry Styles joined the cast of Olivia Wilde's Don't Worry Darling. And he replaced Shia LaBeouf. And I don't know if Shia was ever fully on board or if it was just, you know, he, he got the first offer or whatever. Because I, I don't know what the scheduling is. Sorry, the scheduling issue that Shia said that he had. At least that was in the story as to why he had to drop out. I also, I just don't know if this is, I don't know if Shia LaBeouf is like a, a, a studio lead for, for this kind of movie anyways. Not anymore. And, and that's a good thing, by the way. Like Shia, I love you. You're 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 my ma- you're my guy. You're my man. Um, but I always felt like when you announced Florence Pugh, Chris Pine, Dakota Johnson, Shia always felt like the odd man out there. I was like, does he really fit among this ensemble? Harry Styles is a little bit has that you know sh- shinier sheen. Well, uh, he shines a brighter light, if you will. 
Um, I liked him in, in Dunkirk. I thought he was good. You know, it's a, it wasn't a huge role or anything, but, uh, you know, he acquitted himself very nicely. So I am looking forward to seeing what Harry Styles, what else he can do on the big screen. Um, don't worry, darling. So if you go and read my report on Collider.com, I included some more plot details. And, and it's, it's, I'm getting a very kind of almost like Stepford Wives-ish sense of this thing. So it's, it's set in like the 50s and uh, Florence Pugh is like a, a housewife and she's married to now Harry Styles and every day Harry Styles and all the other men in this small isolated town go to, I think it's called the Oasis. It's this like mysterious workplace and, and Chris Pine runs the workplace and everybody loves Chris Pine's character. I mean, he kind of comes off as like a bit of a cult leader. And then I think like the, 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 cr the cracks in the sheen start to show the cracks are, are about to be exposed. And um, I think that is something like, I think that's what happens with Dakota Johnson's character. Um, and then, you know, Florence Pugh starts to notice these weird things and she's like, am I going crazy? Am I losing my mind? Or all is, is all this stuff actually happening? So, you know, it, I don't know if it's the world's most original, uh, movie, but maybe it has some, some fun surprises up its sleeve. I do think Olivia Wilde is a talented director. Um, she did, she did a good job with book smart. So yeah, I, listen, I, I like psychological thrillers and this is a great cast. So I, I, I'm definitely looking forward to this. Although I, the, the, the Olivia Wilde movie I really want to see is actually that gymnastics movie. Perfect. I, I think she, that could be great. That could be like the next I, Tanya or something like that. But, you know, Don't Worry Darling is, is all cast up. Anyways, so on top, so, so Kroll positioned it as, you know, the first movie that, that Harry Styles had booked since Dunkirk. And then Chris Tapley who is a pretty well-connected dude, who hears things. You know, he's not a breaking news type of reporter, but he hears stuff. He's got his finger on the pulse. He said, is this really the first thing? Like, are we not counting that Marvel movie that Harry Styles has signed on to? So someone, you know, sent that my way, and, and uh, you know, I didn't really dig too much into it because, you know, it's just kind of like a wild goose chase. Like, what... What could it be? Could he could he pop up in uh, Eternals or, or Shang Chi or you know I, I don't know I can't tell you what Marvel movie Harry Styles is in or if he is even in one. But uh, so Tapley deleted that tweet. So it, it's either like one of those tweets that was maybe it wasn't true and maybe Harry Styles or Marvel's team reached out to Chris and was like, hey man, this this isn't actually legitimate, and he deleted it that reason. Or maybe it's because it is true and it's supposed to be a secret and someone was like, Chris, can you delete this tweet? Nobody's supposed to know yet. Chris Tapley doesn't delete a lot of tweets, so that is interesting. Could we see Harry Styles in a Marvel movie? They chase heat. Harry Styles has a ton of heat. It wouldn't surprise me. I'll just put it that way, especially since I haven't. It's like Warner Brothers loves this guy, right? They won, They almost cast him as uh, Elvis. It's almost a tug of war between Disney and Warner Brothers over Harry Styles, but it's not like I've heard of Harry Styles uh, you know, rumored for anything in the DC universe, so maybe he's a Marvel guy now. Who knows? Speaking of the DC universe... Wonder Woman 1984 delayed. Supposed to come out uh, early October. Now it got bumped to Christmas Day. And so I spoke to some WB insiders and they say, listen, Tenet had nothing really to do with this. We've been thinking about this for a while, uh, particularly with all the Christmas real estate that's open. And that may, that may very well be true. They may have had these talks long before Tenet opened. That said, I think it's probably a little disingenuous to say Ten Tenet had nothing to do with it. Tenet, you know, last weekend we talked about how it had made $20 million opening weekend. Well, that wasn't entirely true. That was counting all the previews, you know, those early peaks, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know. And, and normally Thursday sneaks or whatever it is are, are baked into the Friday number. But the, the $20 million number was, a, a, I think it was more like 9 or $11 million. So the, the movie... It, you know, it is doing okay worldwide and international is really saving it. But the domestic box office, you can see it's just not, we're, we're not ready to return here in America and forget the fact that New York and, and LA and San Francisco still aren't open. And they're even thinking of reclosing San Diego, but, uh, you know, I, it's like, I, I do see how Christmas is the frame you want to be in. That is where everybody puts their tent poles, whether it's Top Gun 2 or Star Wars or whatever. And all these movies fled this year. So if you had already made the decision to put Wonder Woman out in October and then all these movies flee December, it's like, okay, I could be convinced to 
a wait a little while for for the the health of theaters to improve and also well you know now kids are out of school it's christmas break so i think it makes sense outside of the context of tenet's box office um which is you know i, I again in a pandemic there, there's no rule book for this warner brothers had to you know reinvent its own rule book and they did want to get the movie out and and you know it, it, International, it, uh, I think it's living up to expectations, but uh, dom domestic is where the problem is. Of course, Tenet could always be re-released in theaters next year when things are back to normal. Just as a Warner Brothers, thank you to Chris Nolan for, for allowing them to bring in some money during all of this, you know? That said, I do, you know, Deadline had a big story uh, about the box office and these dates and stuff like that. And I, we're gonna talk about that more too. Um, I'm trying not to lo lose my train of thought there, but basically, ah, shit, what am, what am I trying to say here? It's like, um, I think it's a bad idea that, that theaters reopened for Tenet, right? They really do this whole big reopening. They got to bring in staff, do all the safety stuff. And then after Tenet, there's no other movies. So it's almost like if Tenet had just waited, then, then theaters could have stayed closed a, a, a bit longer. And maybe that would have hurt them financially. But I don't know if it helps to be paying all these operational costs and there's only one new movie. You know, you can't just keep opening, closing, opening, closing. And that's apparently what they're talking about now is that they may have to shut down from Monday to Wednesday because those are the slowest moving going days. So why are they paying electricity bills and staff and all that stuff to come in when they're really not going to, you know, be getting a ton of people? Not that even, you know, without a pandemic, people, a lot of people went to the movies on Monday through Wednesday. I'm, I'm just saying, I, I don't know that Tenet opening when it did was actually, actually benefited theaters. But we are going to talk more about that stuff. Uh, you know, I guess we could just do it right now. Um, so like, you know, Deadline had this whole thing. I love how every, every site, especially Collider, because I know how the editors uh, feel, that, you know, where I work. People real, I mean, it's a, it's a personal choice. It's up to you if you want to return to theaters, if you, you want to take that risk. But no one is really advocating going to theaters, right? And, and even the people who do go, you see, I, I wore two masks, I wore gloves, I wore a freaking poncho in the theater to see Tenet. Uh, Kate Arthur at Variety did something and she was all, you know, um, masked up and everything. And, and you have to be, that's the responsible thing. But it's like, do we really need to be going to theaters right now? And Deadline is like the only site that I can tell, which is like, we, everybody return to theaters immediately. It's, it's doing like the public a crazy disservice, I think. Um, so Deadline's piece was all about how studios need to work with exhibition to save the theatrical industry. And it's like, I'm, I, I recognize that for the long-term health of this industry, that is important. But at the same time, they're just trying to get through this moment right now. And I don't think it is on I know that they're partners, but I don't know that it's on studios to, to bail out theaters or to rescue them from this moment. They have a responsibility to their own shareholders and investors. And so that brings us to the Mulan experiment. So I think it was Yahoo, I don't know if it was Bloomberg or Yahoo, somebody yesterday came out with some very rough raw numbers for Mulan. So the last we heard about Disney Plus, there were 60 million worldwide subscribers, 60 million globally. Just for the sake of math, we're going to say half of those subscribers are domestic. Those are in the U.S. The other half is international. So we've got 30 million U.S. users. The stat that came out was that about 29% or 30%, we'll say, of those 30 million users paid for Mulan at 30, 30 bucks a pop, right? So... You know, a third of 30 million is 10 million, but really it was, you know, it, that's 33%. We're at 29, 30%. So we're talking about 9 million U.S. people, 9 million U.S. subscribers, 9 million people times $30 is $270, $270 million. <laughs> and Disney gets to keep all of that, right? So it's almost as if they'd released Mulan and it had grossed $550 million, right? Because, you know, then they would have had to, uh, you know, give half of that to theaters and then they get to keep the other half. So, you know, I, I think that that's a pretty, that, that's successful. 
if you're making $270 million off of PVOD rentals, right, on your, on your service alone, so that's not even like the movies available to rent on iTunes or other, you know, VOD platforms. I can't watch it, you know, on Xfinity or Spectrum, you know, cable or something. That's a lot of money, $270 million. And it allows, you know, the movie costs $200 and, and probably another $100 or so for, uh, for marketing. So it's, it's not that um, Disney is necessarily in the black yet, but I, I suspect that they will be by the time this experiment is done. Remember, Mulan doesn't, isn't going to be in front of that paywall until December 4th. So that leaves the rest of September, October, November. Uh, that, it could double its, its uh, you know, Disney Plus receipts then. And ultimately, and ultimately then it, it, it looks like a billion dollar movie on paper. So I think that that paid off. And I think that that is why we also saw a lot of speculation this week, some of which may have been true and some of which has been uh, denied that Black Widow and Soul are going to be moving off of their release dates in, uh, I think, November, and that they may be going straight to Disney Plus and that they may be behind a paywall. You know, if people were willing to spend $30 from Mulan, what are they willing to spend on Black Widow? Could, could we be looking at a $40 or $50 rental the way that Universal was thinking of doing it with Tower Heist back in the day? That's very interesting. So with Black Widow, it's like, you know, once you take that off the, the theatrical calendar, and I can't imagine a Marvel movie not going to theaters, it's, but I understand that if you delay it, then everything has to get delayed. Maybe, maybe. You know, it is a prequel, so it's not... That it, it's, it, it may not affect the, the future timeline of the MCU, but it also may. It may have grave consequences for that. And so, again, it's just when you're talking about Marvel release dates, it's just dominoes, and there's a domino effect. Um, I don't really expect Black You know, Mulan was always something that could have gone either way, frankly. Black Widow is a guaranteed hit. And frankly, I think Soul is too. I mean... First Pixar movie with a black lead? That, that's right, I think, right? Um, that seems like a the, okay, just a gimme theatrical layup. I, I don't know why they don't just push that to next summer, but uh, on, the, on the other hand, if you're looking at these Mulan numbers and that movie, which is a tough sell for little kids and stuff like that, you know, I, I think that Mulan is more for teenagers and adults. Soul could freaking double those numbers. I mean, imagine if you had half of the 30 million u.s subscribers so now 15 million at you know maybe it's more than 30 bucks a pop but uh i'm just saying it's it's a lot it's a lot that's a 450 million i believe uh receipt if i can do the math in my head so you know disney may very well be incentivized to release those movies on disney plus even though i think that they are leaving money on the table by not releasing them in theaters the question is just when are theaters going to return to normal you know, they, they are open now, but this, you know, they're certainly not normal. Uh, we talked about that, uh, Jonathan Major thing, the harder they fall cast. I mean, I just wanted to let you, like, they, so they got uh, Regina King, Lakeith Stanfield, Delroy Lindo, Z uh, Zazie Beetz. So a hell of a cast in, in that uh, The Harder They Fall movie. That's going to be a one to watch from uh, James Samuel. Keep an eye out for him. But speaking of Delroy Lindo, Variety had a report today that uh, Netflix is going to be campaigning him in the best actor race. And I think it had always sort of been assumed that Delroy Lindo, you know, could be the front runner for best supporting actor this year because the movie really is an ensemble piece. Although in Variety's telling of it, they, they basically say, you know, Netflix's reasoning is that Delroy Lindo does come off as the lead. He is given more screen time in the second half of the picture, which is true. You know, if I had to pick a lead out of the ensemble, I would pick Delroy Lindo. So I don't know necessarily why they're putting him. I think his chances would be better in, in Best Supporting Actor, as would any actor who has, you know, significant screen time. And, and maybe they're up against people who only have 15, 20 minutes, like, that performance is going to stand about, out about uh, a bit more. Um, it's a, it's an uphill battle in 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 Defy Bloods, and not because I don't think Del Orlando was great, because he was. He was excellent. I didn't love the movie. Didn't love the movie. I thought it was good, but I thought it should have been better. You know, it, it's classic Spike Lee stuff where he, you know the what makes Spike Lee great is what makes the movie good, and what. The drawbacks, the weaknesses that Spike Lee has, I, I think are evident in Defy Blood. So I don't know if that is going would be enough to win Best Actor, but 
I think in any category you put him in, it is enough to merit a nomination. It's, it just may be tougher this year. It's always tougher to score a Best Actor nomination than a Best Supporting Actor nomination, or at least usually. Jessica Chastain, we've got some uh, TV stuff. Jessica Chastain signed on to a Tammy Wynette limited series, I believe. But this is one of those things where it's like it's on Spectrum and then it'll be on Paramount Network nine months later. And I don't know. Did, did you hear anybody? Was there any buzz about uh, that Jessica Alba, Gabriel Union, Bad Boys spinoff? Like, I, and I saw that. I've seen ads that. That's getting a second window, as is uh, the Richard Jewell uh, Manhunt series with, uh, with Cameron Britton. And Jack Houston, that is getting a second window. I saw that advertised like it's a new show. It's like actually, you know, a bunch of cables, millions of cable subscribers have already had access to it. They just may not have known it. So I'm not a fan of the, the cable only thing because like I can subscribe to any streaming service I want, but if I'm an AT&T or Xfinity guy, like I can't watch a Spectrum show until that second window. Don't, don't love that. What was interesting to me about this uh, Jessica Chastain thing besides – the fact that she's going to be playing another Tammy. She obviously stars in the eyes of Tammy Faye uh, with Andrew Garfield coming up. Is that Josh Brolin is a producer on the project. Josh Brolin is not exactly a prolific producer. He, you know, and it's like, I think he even called his company Josh Brolin Productions. Um, you rarely see an eponymous shingle from, from movie stars, right? I think that Josh Brolin probably was attached to this at one point. He may very well double back to it. I don't know. Although it may conflict with his uh, Amazon show Outer Range. That's sort of why I thought he wasn't available to do it. Maybe the guy's just not a good singer, but uh, you know, it's clear that he, I'm pretty sure he's been with this project for a while um, developing it either, you know, alongside Jessica or whatever. Um, I think they'd actually make an interesting pairing on screen and I could see him playing that kind of, Good old boy country singer, although I know that they had a lot of uh, friction in, in, their, in their marriage and relationship together. Um, it'll, I don't know. It'll just be interesting to see whether Brolin steps up or, 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 you know, if they cast somebody else who is a known singer, you know, beats me. But that's it. I'm not a country guy. It's just an interesting project. Anytime Jessica, an actress of, of Jessica Chastain's uh, caliber is going to do TV, you got to pay attention. Uh, Disney Plus announced a Doogie Kamaloha, MD. This is a Hawaiian reboot, more diverse, of, uh, of Doogie Howser, MD. I didn't grow up really watching Doogie Howser, but I love this, the direction that they're taking this, this reboot. Like, this is the way to do it. You can't just have another young, white, teenage boy, uh, you know, prodigal genius. Uh, this, this is great. It, it's inclusive it's going to have a diverse lead this girl is balancing you know what it's like being a teenage girl which is i can't even fathom uh, impossibly difficult with being a a doctor um and it's going to be set on the island of hawaii i believe on one of the islands and uh i listen i i dig it i hope that they find a a great actress to do this i don't know if they'll go for someone like uh the girl who played moana uh is, is it Auli Cravalho? um i never know how to pronounce that one but she seems like she would be kind of the obvious choice. Maybe too obvious, but yeah. I, 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 I like that direction. If you're going to take a, a classic show like a Doogie Howser, which you know means a lot to some people, um, I think you got to go in this radical different direction. So, that, you know, you just, you don't risk any real comparisons to it, you know? So pro- props to Disney Plus for just completely a new take on that. I finally ran my Lars Ulrich interview, the drummer from Metallica. You know, we'd already talked about the Jungle Cruise score last week. The stuff that was making the rounds this week, I was a little bit surprised, was uh, all the talk of the Metallica biopics. I asked Lars, you know, with Rocket Man and Bohemian Rhapsody, would Metallica ever be open to something like that? And he, he actually talked about some of the choices that they used to have back in the day. Like Carlos Santana would play Kirk Hammett, James Spader. Uh, it was going to play one of them. I forget who the other one was. But uh, again, check out that full interview with Lars Ulrich. It's one of the best ones I've ever done. It was uh, long. The guy's a huge film buff. So if you're a film buff and you want to know what to watch or what Lars is watching, definitely check that out because we just we talked for 20, 25 minutes at least just about the stuff that him and his family have been uh, binge, binge watching and uh, checking out during this pandemic. Uh, Sarah Snook starring in Jane Austen, a Jane Austen adaptation, Persuasion. Not for me. Cat Coiro to direct She-Hulk. 
that's a, she's an interesting director to come aboard that uh, Disney Plus Marvel series. Still no casting on that show. Rob Morgan signed on to Adam McKay's Don't Look Up. Big fan of Rob Morgan, and I think that this is you know going to be positioned as a lead. It's kind of fascinating. Like I, I don't know if this is the the role that. You know, we'd heard Leonardo DiCaprio for, or maybe it was Christian Bale. I, it's all a jumble on, on, on this particular project. Uh, I'd heard a lot of names. I don't know if this is, I feel like this is the, the, the second lead. Though I'm not entirely sure. So I won't get ahead. Is a very, very good character actor. I thought he was wonderful in, in Mudbound. And uh, it's great to see him back on, on Netflix, working with someone like Adam McKay. Ethan Hawke directing a documentary about Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. This couple was more, you know, this, they were ahead of my time. You know, I, I don't know firsthand about their uh, incredible industry romance and whatnot, but by all accounts, it, it was truly something special. You know, they weren't really a Hollywood couple. They went and lived in Connecticut. And Paul Newman, you know, a, a beloved scre screen icon. They have, you know, an incredible charity. Like this... It, the story got more pickup than I suspected that it would online, which means I think that there's a lot of affection and affinity for, for Paul Newman, for his memory and for Joanne Woodward. Uh, so yeah, I'd be down to check out, you know, an, an, a, an old fashioned Hollywood documentary about that couple. Uh, some big screen five stuff happening this week. Surprised I didn't push that, uh, push that up higher on the show. Nev Campbell is back. So that's a done deal. Finally, we closed it. A couple of weeks ago, I, I sort of talked about, like, what is the holdup with Nev Campbell? So it, it's clearly they, they whatever, whether it was money or a script issue, they cleared that up. She signed on the dotted line. I still have a feeling that Nev Campbell is going to be the opening scene and, and get killed. I mean, if not her, it's got to be Gail or Dewey. Like, it's just, it's just a no-brainer, folks. You, you got to bring this, this whole franchise sort of full circle the series is known for its openings. Drew Barrymore, that's one of the, the most famous scenes in horror history. And I just don't know where else, what, what else you do with Sidney Prescott's arc. So if she were to die in the first scene, I think that would be very fitting. And maybe Deputy Dewey shows up to invest, investigate. Maybe Gail Weathers shows up to, uh, you know, to, to do a story on it. Or, you know. The interesting thing about this is also that Marley Shelton from Scream 4 is going to be re reprising her deputy judy role or whatever the hell it was three and four is just like i've erased that from my memory i should go back and watch three and four because i really don't think i've seen either one more than once maybe i saw scream three twice but uh, marley shelton as an actress doesn't really do much for me i don't know why they're insisting on bringing her back maybe she has a greater purpose that i'm not aware of uh they also filled out the the rest of the cast dylan minette mason gooding uh, who was in Booksmart, Mikey Madison from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Jasmine Savoy Brown, and my man, Kyle Gallner. Kyle Gallner is a little bit older than, than some of these folks. Um, he's been around a while. Like he was in, he was playing, you know, young, young high school uh, victims in a Nightmare on Elm Street reboot a decade ago. But he, he's a really great actor. Like he, he's just always interesting. And... You know, he he could obviously be a great red herring. He looks like he looks like he could be a serial killer or something. Dylan Minnette. This is the interesting casting, though, for me. So Dylan Minnette is an awful like, an awful lot like Jack Quaid. They're the kind of guys who would go up for the same parts. So the fact that there's two of them in the same movie, I feel like one is there to like either cast suspicion on the other or serve as an, as a red herring. You know. I feel like it was very intentional, that choice of Dylan, ben Dylan Manette and Jack Quaid together. Very intentional. Because they definitely play the same type. Uh, I wrote up a little thing on Soulmates this week. This show hasn't debuted. Um, they, they put out like a clip explaining it, and I thought it was interesting. Like if you're into Black Mirror, you know, check out this, this Soulmates clip. But it's, it's set in the future. It's an anthology series, AMC's first anthology series, and it's set in a world where there's this, you know, app, this computer program, this algorithm that can tell you conclusively who your soulmate is. You know, the question to me is, would you even want to know? Like, what if you took this test and you found out that you're the person that you're dating, or maybe even the person that you're married to, isn't your soulmate after all? What if, you, you know, you take the test and, and, you know, you identify as a straight guy and this test tells you conclusively, your soulmate is your best friend, Billy. 
and, and you're, you know, you should, according to this algorithm, be gay. Um, it's, a fa- it's a very fascinating premise. They have some interesting pairings. I know Sarah Snook is paired with Kingsley ben in one episode. Uh, I think Nathan Stewart Jarrett is paired with um, Bill Skarsgård. So, so, you know, it, it's not just male-female couples. There are gay couples. There's interracial couples that they're exploring on the show. And I'm down to check it out. You know, AMC, it, it, I was let down by the Dispatches from Elsewhere show with Jason Siegel, or I watched one episode and it just didn't, didn't hook me at all. Uh, so hopefully that they're leading with their best foot forward. You know, uh, you got to put your best episode out first in an anthology. That, that's my thinking, because if it's not good, no one's going to sample the rest of them. So keep an eye out for Soulmates. Uh, some podcast stuff. Hollywood is doing a, a podcast on the, the Hollywood Con Queen. That's going to be called Chameleon. Uh, th- this should probably be a show of some kind. I don't really listen to these podcasts. I don't know why. I know why they're so big now. It's because they're a lot easier to produce than, than rounding up a camera crew and everything. All you need is a microphone. Uh, but yeah, I just don't have time to be listening to podcasts, even though this one does sound super interesting. And maybe Chameleon, it will be you know the next serial or whatever. Meanwhile, Elle Fanning signed on to narrate uh, the Deadly Internet Drug That Cooks People Alive podcast with Jessica Wapner. She's going to write it. She's the former science editor at Newsweek. Now, the title grabbed me. I never heard of this before. It's based on this Daily Beast uh, article that I think Jessica actually wrote. And I read that this morning, and it was terrifying. It was all about, like, this drug DNP that they used to put in artillery shells and people had been using as a diet pill and, and bodybuilders had been using it to, to gain muscle because it, you know, it just creates energy. And so it just burns the fat, but sometimes, you know, there's reactions where it doesn't just burn fat. It burns everything in your stomach and you start melting from the inside. I mean, it, it sounds crazy that, that people can order this shit online and put it into their bodies and they have no idea what it does to them. I mean, there was one story, a kid, you know, took too much DPN and he knew it immediately, could feel it. There's nothing he could have done. Drugs in his system now. He, he was screwed. He, he called his father. He was like, hey, I'm, I'm overdosing. I'm probably going to die in an hour. I love you. Goodbye. Like, wow. Always be careful with the pills that you're putting in your body, folks. Um, so, again, that's another really interesting sounding podcast that I'd probably watch a limited series of. But as a podcast, I just can't. I, I don't have the time. Uh, Collider was one of a few outlets who announced the uh, Madonna movie this week, officially. Last week, there were rumors about Madonna, you know, actually co- uh, co-writing a biopic with Diablo Cody. But I had heard a couple weeks ago that not only was she co-writing it, that she was actually going to be directing it for Universal. So it was kind of interesting how this one all, all went down. Um, Basically, I reached out to a source about Madonna directing her own biopic, and within a few minutes, I, I had a, a call or an email from Madonna's team. So, <laughs> no not to go back there. Anyways, I uh, worked with them on, on this announcement. You know, it was all embargoed for 2 p.m. Of course, Deadline has got a deadline. Their story went up at 1.59. Mike Fleming, you know, I feel like I've gotten over a lot of issues I had early in my career with Mike Fleming. I definitely respect him and what he's doing with Deadline. But Fleming, would it kill you? Would it kill you to adhere to a fucking embargo, dude? Like, is everybody's clock broken at Deadline? Is it an internal mechanism with the actual, like, back-end system where it can't recognize when a button is being pushed? When there's an embargo, you either set the automatic timer or you wait on the clock, it's right here, and the second that it hits two o'clock, you hit the button, boom. There's the timestamp. So driving me crazy with the timestamp games deadline. Not a fan of it, but whatever. Who cares? It's the principle of it to me. I care, but in, in the scope of things, it's not like anybody read his Madonna article before mine. Um, my Madonna article actually had speculation about casting. So if you'd pay attention to Madonna's Instagram, uh, she had recently followed Julia Garner and Florence Pugh. Florence Pugh is pretty busy. I don't know what the timetable is for this Madonna movie. Julia Garner's schedule is a little bit freer. She's got to obviously go back and do a bunch of Ozark episodes. But uh, just in looking at Julia, you know, Julia Ozark, Julia Garner with her blonde curls and and the feisty attitude, uh, you know, the fire that she spits on Ozark, I think she'd kind of make a fantastic Madonna. She's certainly a rising star in the, in the film and television world. I don't know if you could get, you know, maybe a more accomplished 
act, you know, like movie star actress. Because I don't know that, that Julia Garner would, is necessarily a box office draw at this point in her career. But again, you're coming to this movie, you know, for Madonna. It doesn't really matter who, who plays her. You're, you're there to see Madonna's story. And she's right. Who better than her to tell it? People who are like, eh, this is a bad idea. She shouldn't be directing her own biopic. She should find a real filmmaker. Like, I, I get that. Um, I just don't think it necessarily matters that much. Because either way, she's going to have a ton of input. Either way, it's not like, you know, the movie would, would be warts and all without Madonna and she's coming in and sanitizing it. First of all, I don't think Madonna is necessarily that type of artist. Uh, I think she's very well aware of the criticisms that, that movies like Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man faced. But in this day and age, you kind of have to have the artists involved, particularly if you want to use all the music and everything and just have their support. You don't want to make a Madonna movie the way Universal was going to with Blonde Ambition and not have Madonna's support and just have her dragging the movie. That's not going to work for anybody. Um, so it didn't surprise me that, that Universal, I love it. They were basically like, uh, you know, they, they still own the rights. They still hold the rights to this Blonde Ambition script, which placed very highly on the blacklist and by all accounts was very, very good. Um, but yeah, they, they've stopped developing it and this is the Madonna project that they are now moving forward on. Uh, so yeah, we'll, you know, stay, stay tuned for casting. We'll, we'll see. Uh, what else we got? What else we got? We got a lot of trailer talk and, and I do want to fit, a, uh, some other stuff in. Um, THR had an interview with, uh, with, uh, Jillian, Jillian Flint. Forgive me. The, Ut the Utopia creator, the writer of Gone Girl, Sharp Objects. And uh, she talked about, you know, the development of Utopia because it was originally supposed to be at HBO with David Fincher directing. And Fincher wanted to make it for $90 million, And HBO was only going to give him $80 million. And maybe it was 81 or 80 million or whatever the fuck. But Jillian Flynn said they were only $9 million off. Which in the, in, in the scheme of things is not that much for a big you know, buzzy series that would have starred Rooney Mara. But Fincher, as Fincher is wont to do, balked. And he was like, listen, this is how much the, the, the series costs. It's going to cost 90 the way I want to do it. If you don't want to make it at 90, then you don't want to do it the way I do it. And so I don't want to do it with you. And so the project languished for a little bit before Jillian brought it over to Amazon. She said that the final budget was $65 million spent on eight episodes. So each episode is about $8 million dollars. And now that I can talk about Utopia, I believe the embargo lifted uh, this morning. I thought it was money well spent, very well worth it. I'm into it. It is eerie, the fact that it's set during this deadly flu pandemic. And uh, it, you know, that's what the show's about. And that is the environment in which the series is being released. Uh, but I really, like, it's very violent. Uh, you may want to sample an episode of the British series, because I thought that the first episode was pretty close. Um, you know, I thought Rain Wilson's really good. John Cusack is like this, you know, Elon Musk figure. Uh, who else was very good in it? Desmond Borges is sort of like that, the heart and soul as, as Wilson Wilson. And then um, Christopher Denham, right? Uh, he, he plays Arby. So he's kind of like the villain, uh, at, the, at, the, at least at the beginning of the show. So yeah, if you're, you know, if you've got Amazon, definitely watch Utopia at the end of the month once you've finished watching The Boys. I don't know if they're, they're probably going to release that weekly too and, and, and stretch it out. I know people are upset about uh, the fact that that's how The Boys is rolling out. Not sure if Utopia is the same. It probably is. Uh, they didn't give us the last episode, so I don't know how it ends. I'm, I'm dying to find out. Really don't want to have to wait two more months to do it, but that them's the breaks. That's the downside of being, uh, you know, having early access to this stuff. I'm gonna have to wait until Thanksgiving to watch the final two episodes of Fargo. And by then it'll, you know, have been three months. Fargo, by the way, that's another one that saw its embargo uh, lift this week. And guys, it's great. It's absolutely worthy of being, uh, you know, mentioned in the same breath as those past three seasons. I just love, I love this world. I love Noah Hawley and, and what he the way that he writes and creates characters. And this is a much more diverse season. It's basically, you know, the blacks against the Italians, they've traded sons to keep each other honest. And then something happens and, and the whole truce kind of goes to shit. The, the cast is just uniformly excellent from top to bottom, not just Chris Rock, Jason Schwartzman, Jesse Buckley, but a lot of unknown people, uh, Emery Crutchfield, Kelsey Asbill, uh, Salvatore Esposito, uh, just, you know, 
you, you got to watch Fargo. It is really pound for pound the best show on television. And I just can't say enough about how great the season is. It's, it's a fantastic setup. Like what a great premise. And then you've got people like Timothy Oliphant and, and uh, Jack Houston and everybody's, everybody's just firing on all cylinders this season. So don't miss that one. Uh, the ringer had a good oral history of the town the other day that I, I uh, lapped up. There was an interesting little factoid in it about uh, Chris Pine. We almost took over that Jeremy Renner uh, one. That, that, sorry, the Jeremy Renner part. I, I guess like Hurt Locker was just coming out. There, there was good buzz around him, but Ben Affleck had really only seen Dahmer, which is like the polar opposite of what he was going for with the Jim character. So I just yeah, it's very interesting that Chris Pine very nearly got that that uh, that movie because I think it, yeah it did. It ended up getting Jeremy Renner an Oscar nomination and a well deserved one too. Um, all right, we've got uh, some some mailbag questions. We've got a rumor of the week. We've got what else have we got here? There's the, all right, we got to talk about trailer time. Oh, before I do, Chris Rock speaking of Fargo, he's writing a script. Did a big cover story with THR, which he revealed he's writing. He's already finished two scripts. One he's writing for him, Dave Chappelle, and Adam Sandler to star in. The second one is a, a movie like Bad Lieutenant with an insane female lead. Both of that, those sound awesome to me. Like, I I mean, I'd love to see a, a woman play a part like Bad Lieutenant, where it's, all, it's a bit almost like Nicole Kidman in Destroyer, although that, I was mixed on that movie. And then Chris Rock getting together with Chappelle and Adam Sandler – that could either be hilarious or just, you know, from what I take from where Chris Rock is in his, you know, in his life and his career and he's in therapy seven days a week and, uh, and all that stuff, I may, maybe it'll be a little bit more of a dramedy. It'll be a little bit more contemplative. Like imagine Last Flag Flying was a little heavy, that Linklater movie with Carell and, and Cranston and Fishburne because they're, you know, bringing a soldier's body somewhere. So it, it was a little heavy, but Imagine a last flag flying type of movie with Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, and Adam Sandler. Sign me the fuck up. That sounds awesome. Uh, a lot of trailers this week. The Mandalorian. Like, you guys know me. I'm not a Star Wars guy. I love the first season of The Mandalorian. This did seem a little bit more Star Warsy. A lot more. But, but listen, I, I, can't, I can't wait for this show to come back. I, I, I've been uh, listening to the score, just like that, that you know, opening main title all week just to get uh, get me pumped up. Got a first trailer for The Trial of the Chicago 7, Aaron Sorkin's star-studded movie. You know, like Judas and the Black Messiah, I thought this looked great. It had a real power to the people vibe to it. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Sasha Baron Cohen, like the closing where Sasha Baron Cohen's like, give me a second friend. I've never been on trial for my thoughts before. And just like the big, bold font showing you that like, this is a big, important movie. I, I can't wait. It's going to be on Netflix, I think, at the in mid-October. It's going to be, I think it's getting a small theatrical release at the end of the month. Again, I don't know what that really entails, but uh, it's also a courtroom drama. I can see why Paramount was like, eh, what are we, we can't put this out. This isn't going to make any money for us, especially if we have to spend 30, 40, 50 million dollars just to market it. Netflix, you know, they're, they're agile, they're nimble. That, that's one of the many advantages that it has over its competitors. We've got a trailer for The Father, which, you know, is supposed to be uh, contain a great Anthony Hopkins performance. He plays a guy who's kind of losing it. I don't know if it's, I think it's Al Alzheimer's, maybe something else, but, uh, you know, clearly uh, you know, for forgetful. We got a trailer for Synchronic, which is the new Benson Moorhead movie. I, I couldn't stand their last film, The Endless. It was the worst thing I saw in 2018. But I'm not someone who, who you know, ho holds grudges like that. Like, I thought this movie looked pretty interesting. I've heard nothing but good things. Got a lot of rave reviews out of Toronto last year at a Fantastic Fest. I know Frosty isn't a big Anthony Mackie guy, but I love Anthony Mackie. I've been with Mackie since the beginning. Uh, and, and I am, you know, I want to see Jamie Dornan do more shit than uh, tie up Dakota, Dakota Johnson. So, Benson and Moorhead, you get a clean slate with me on this one. I'm going in, and I want to like it, and, and I suspect that I will, but, you know, everybody loved The Endless, too, and I just don't know what they saw in that film. We got to look at Love and Monsters with Dylan O'Brien. You know, I, I wasn't expecting much from this movie. I kind of expected it to debut on VOD, which is what's happening. Uh, but even without a pandemic, I thought, damn, I would just toss this on VOD anyways, like they did the Boy Scouts versus uh, Zombies one. 
it looked, uh, you know, better than I was expecting. Uh, Jessica Henwick looks interesting. I didn't watch Iron Fist, but I heard she was kind of the best thing about that show. And Dylan O'Brien, I, I have a soft spot for him. Uh, there's, there's something just likable about the guy. Maybe it's the fact that he's a Mets fan. So he probably doesn't like the Yankees either, like me, a Boston boy. But um, listen, he, he learned his survival skills. He honed them on the Maze Runner. So hopefully they serve him well here. The Comedy Store on Showtime, a docuseries from Mike Binder. I don't know if I can talk about this one yet. I watched two episodes last night. I'll just say that I can't wait to watch the third one. We got trailers for the Sundance movies, Scare Me and Save Yourselves. I miss Save Yourselves. Um, but I really like doing that interview with those two stars at Sundance and those directors. Those directors are going to blow up. Keep an eye on those directors of Save Yourselves because they, they've got a few irons in the fire, a couple jobs in the work. Scare Me was one of the worst things I saw at Sundance. It, it's just, so it's basically somebody telling you about a better movie. Like that's, the, the movie's about storytelling and it's just people in a, in a cabin telling each other stories that sound much more interesting than the actual movie that we're watching. Uh, some TV stuff, Moonbase 8. Like, I, I love John C. Riley. I love Fred Armisen. I can't stand Tim Heidecker. The trailer made me laugh a couple times, so maybe I'll check that one out, although th that may also be a show I sample, and I'm just like, yeah, this is not for me. Industry, I thought, looked really good. HBO dropped a, a trailer for that, and I couldn't name a single star in it, uh, but it, it looked great. There was, like, this, you know, like a black financial analyst who just wanted to be, uh, you know, judge on on her merits and how she did her job and it looked intense it looked like euphoria meets billions if you will that's a good pitch so industry sign me up and then the last shift i just wrote up that this morning that's the sundance movie with richard jenkins uh you know working at a fast food joint dispensing wisdom on a young uh black new uh staffer we also got trailers for all the Welcome to the Blumhouse titles, The Lie, Nocturne, Evil Eye, and Black Box. Evil Eye and Black Box didn't really do anything for me. I know those are the, the diverse entries. Um, yeah, they, you know, it just looked a little generic. I don't know. I mean, all these movies kind of look generic. That's why they're all kind of being packaged together and dumped on Amazon. But The Lie and Nocturne did look like the standouts. The Lie is uh, Peter Sarsgaard and, and Maria Enos. And their daughter, Joey King, who was excellent on the act on Hulu. If you haven't seen that, check that out. She impulsively kills her best friend and they, you know, have to like, you know, lie for her and cover it up. So that sounds like an interesting thriller from Vina Sood, who is the uh, creator of The Killing. She pairs her with the star of that show. And then Nocturne stars Sydney Sweeney from Euphoria as like, uh, you know, a, a, an aspiring pianist or musician who's in, uh, you know, competition with her twin sister at this elite arts academy and then she gets her hands on this notebook and it, it affects her performance uh, for the better but you know maybe not the sisters so i love movies about sibling rivalry i, I do think sydney sweeney is an, an, an interesting up-and-comer and that was the most interesting of the four uh, welcome to the blumhouse titles i thought uh before we get to mailbag and rumor of the week you know i i I read this piece this week uh, on Hollywood Reporter from April Rain, who is the creator of Oscar So White, and I just, I wanted to address it. Uh, obviously, I talked about the diversity requirements last week, the new requirements for, for Best Picture nominees, and, and one commenter, um, you know, took me to task on what I said on the podcast, and, and listen, I'm glad they did, because they forced me to maybe clarify myself. I wrote a long, long response on, on last week's uh, comment section um, although I don't know if he deleted his comment and then my response was deleted in turn. I'm not entirely sure what happened there. But with April Rain, like, she makes some good points and she makes some bad points, okay? She basically says, so the Academy can't win with her. She says that the new standards will change little, which is true. And so to me, then, I, like I asked last week, then what's the point? To me, change needs to come from within the academy, not via the organization itself, okay? If you tell someone you need to make your movies more diverse, for some, some people will be like, great, you know, I, I was gonna do that anyway. Some people are, don't wanna be told what to do, nor should they be told what to do. They should, so it's like, it, it's like telling a teenager, this is what I wrote in the comments, section, it's like telling a teenager to make, to clean their room or make their bed. They're, they may do it, but they're gonna do it through gritted teeth. And 
so what is the point of these producers or, you know, these studios, whoever it is, doing these diversity things through gritted teeth, right? Let them cast all white movies, make these all white movies, and then watch them suffer. You know, like, if, if because it can't just be, I want there to be change or, or this group of people wants there to be change, so there should be change. Change cannot be mandated. It has to be something that you want to do. So I think people should be allowed to make all white movies and those movies should be allowed to be eligible for best picture. And the way that you get change, okay, is if those movies are eligible and then they don't get nominated. And then the producer's like, wow, I thought I made a great movie. What happened? Well, it's because you went with this all white cast. You know, or, or you know, why aren't, uh, why is my all white movie not doing well at the box office? Well, it's because you, you didn't cater to minorities. You didn't put any people of color in your movie. So I think that producers and studios need to learn those harsh lessons themselves. It needs to be action. It needs to be shown to them, not told to them. Okay. So going, moving on. Uh, you know, April points out that the Academy did double the number of people of color and women. So it did meet its goal there. However, and she's 100% right about this, it's the percentages that matter. So when you're invent inviting just as many white guys into the fold, it doesn't change the percentage at all. It changes the numbers, but not the percentages. So as April points out, they're still, the Academy is still 81% white and still 67% male. That is no good. Like I, I, I may not actually advocate for uh, these diversity rules. I'm not a fan of them, but I would actually be fine if the Academy included an, a, a no white guy class of invitees to the Academy. If they went one year and said, you know what? No white guys, no matter how deserving, are getting into the academy this year, you know, there'll be invites next year and we will in invite them. You know, anyone who may have been invited this year, we're gonna invite them next year. But this year's class is exclusively women and people of color. I would have no problem with that because that is how you balance the percentages. You can't just have women and people of color come in and then also have a ton of white guys come in. It's counterintuitive. Moving on, April says, uh, that, you know, Best Picture has basically become little more than a popularity contest am among white men. Give me a break. That is just, even if it was true, okay, even if it was true, then these are the same white men who voted for 12 Years a Slave and Moonlight and Parasite. So if it is a popularity contest of, of, of white men, it's not like white men are saying we're only voting for all white movies. Like, like you have to give the Academy credit. This idea that the Academy is a racist organization, I've been fighting it for years. It's not true. Are there racists in the Academy? Yes, there are. But that's true of, of, of all walks of life. I, and, and to me, it was like I was talking about this with my dad last night, and he didn't get, like, I, I'm just a big free speech uh, proponent. And so I said, Dad, if, if a Nazi showed up outside our house and started yelling anti-Semitic things, I would defend that Nazi's right to free speech, okay? As long as the Nazi is not, you know, committing violence, he has every right to stand on public property and say whatever he wants. And so do we. We could go to the Nazi's house and say down with Nazis. And it's like, that is the beauty of America. And I don't want to live in a country where... You know, you, you, you can't have, you know, freedom of speech or things are forced on you or, or points of view, ideas, things like that. April says that this isn't progress, so the Academy would like you to believe otherwise. I mean, she, I'm like torn on that one because I agree. It's, what is the point of this? If it's not going to change anything, then how can you call it progress? But at the same time, it's not nothing. It's not like they just sat on their hands and ignored the problem. She calls it window dressing on a house that has been condemned. Okay. Uh, she says, one wonders why the Academy is waiting so long to institute these changes. That is another good point by April Rain. I, and I get the, mo the movie making process, it, it takes a long time. So that to me is probably why it's 2024 that these things will go into effect because, you know, some people have already started writing, developing, producing, drawing up contracts for, you know, big award 
prestige dramas that maybe they have hopes will be nominated in 2023, 2024. So, you know, those, mo those plans are already in motion and I get that you can't change the goal line there, uh, you know, before the end. Um, but, but she's right. Like if this is really so important, why are we waiting four years to do it? She says 11 of the past 15 best picture Oscar winners would easily meet the new standards. However, if films like Green Book, which this is, this is a quote, if films like Green Book, which was widely criticized for its handling of issues regarding marginalized communities, and films like The Irishman, in which marginalized communities aren't present on screen, even as background, can still qualify for the new standards without even trying, they don't go far enough. I'm sorry. April Rain, what are you talking about, okay? Like, The Irishman, in which marginalized communities aren't present on screen, even as background. So, like, did we want black people as background characters in the Irishman, does that suddenly make the Irishman an acceptable movie to you? The Irishman should have, should just be judged on its merits. And on its merits, I didn't think it was a great movie. I didn't think it should have been nominated for Best Picture, okay? Green Book, films like Green Book, which was widely criticized for its handling of issues regarding marginalized communities. Guess what, April? Best Pictures they can be criticized. That's okay. It's a, like, movies are allowed to win that have been criticized. You, you can't just vote for this perfect movie, and this perfect movie is what we hold up as the gold standard of the year. That is just not how art works, and it's crazy that the Academy is even taking its cues from someone who thinks like this. She says, the real work regarding inclusion should begin when the screenwriter opens their laptop. Who is telling the story and whose story is being told should be the questions that drive filmmaking. I cannot disagree stronger, strongly enough. Like, it, when someone says, I've got a great story for you, the first question out of my mouth isn't, well, who's telling the story and whose story is being told? The question is, what's the story? That's all that matters. I don't care who's telling the story. I don't care whose story is being told. I just want to know, is, what is the story? Is it a good story? Then I'm in. And if it's a great story, then let's nominate it. Whether it's all black people, all white people, all Asian people, it doesn't matter. She says, what the Academy has engaged in is performative allyship. The impressed release might seem impressive, but the Academy is yet to ensure the traditionally underrepresented community, communities not only have a seat at the table, but are leading the conversation. To me, that's just not a conversation. Why does the conversation need to be led by anyone? Why, you know, that's people, like when people say leading the conversation, it just means that they're talking to people, right? They're not talking with people. No one needs to lead the conversation, though I agree that it is a conversation that we need to have. It is not the Academy's job to ensure shit that they have no control over. The Academy's not a producer. It's full of producers, all of whom make their own individual decisions, but the Academy can't create guidelines to producing. That's not what they do. Their job, is, like a critic, is to judge the final product. And yes, they do a lot more stuff besides the, the, the show each year, and they have educational programs and, and you, know, uh, you know, programs dedicated to preserving art, both from white people and from people in marginalized communities. And I think that's in a very important part of the Academy. But when we're talking about the Oscars, it's just not their job to mandate, you know, who should be making what kind of art and, and how. Like, let people make the art they make and then judge it on its merits. You know, and, and the more people of color that we get into the Academy, the more and more that, those, that they will not tell, but show the producers of these all-white movies that, hey, we're not gonna, this isn't going to fly in this organization anymore. So that's what I had to say about April Rain's uh, piece. And, and you know, I, I gave it a lot of thought. I wasn't just shooting from the handle here uh, or flying from the hip. Um, okay, mail, we got a few more questions. I know I'm going long, sorry, Thad. Mailbag questions from Daniel Clements. Slowly, Hollywood actors have been appearing in more video games. More recently, a small indie game published by Annapurna Interactive is starring Daisy Ridley, James McAvoy, and Willem Dafoe. Because of COVID, do you think more actors would do roles like this? And do you think it helps or hinders their status in Hollywood? I think it's a fallacy that, uh, that things like video games or, or commercials, you know, hinder anyone's status in Hollywood. I, I think as like, you know, guys like Clooney, Brad Pitt, Scorsese, De Niro, they make these overseas commercials because I, I, it's, it's true. You don't want to just, if you're on TV on, the, on these commercials all the time, 
you don't want to just be available for free because then it's like, well, what, then why would someone pay $10 to, to see me in a movie or something? And they also don't want to seem like shills and, and sellouts and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I do think that we will see, excuse me, I do think that we will see a lot more actors like Elle Fanning with that podcast doing podcasts, doing video uh, games. Anna Faris left her big CBS sitcom paying her millions of dollars a year. She's going to focus on her podcast. So anything that you, where you don't have to be in front of a camera and you can just go into a sound booth where they can send you a microphone, you record it from home or something. Yes, you're going to see a lot more of that. And I don't think it's going to hinder anyone's status in Hollywood. Will Drajulis says, I just saw Harry Styles replace Shia and Don't Worry Darling due to, due to a scheduling conflict. It seemed like a great career move for Shia. Any clue on what this other thing going on is? I actually don't know, Will. I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I don't know what else Shia has cooking. And I would tell you if I did. Derek Walker says, uh, I was wondering, who is your favorite musician turned actor and why? He also says, per your recommendation, I finally got around to seeing the movie Mope and I enjoyed it. I remember when that story was in the news. Do you have any other recommendations for movies that have come out this year that nobody's talking about? Uh, also, per your recommendation, I watched The Platform and that's my top movie of the year. Well, yes, you should all absolutely uh, watch The Platform. It was terrific. Uh, other movies that I think are flying under the radar. That is a good question. Let me uh, stall for time by answering your first question, Derek. The uh, musicians turn actors that I love. I would say uh, Lady Gaga in A Star is Born, I thought should have won the Oscar. So that to me may be very well be the, the peak of musicians turn actors. I thought she was incredible. I thought Courtney Love was amazing in The People versus Larry Flint. Like she was just, you know, the whole singer and, and Kurt Cobain's, you know, uh, wife. Um, and she really proved her, that she can handle some, some tough dramatic stuff in the people versus Larry Flint. And then the last one was Dwight Yoakam in panic room. And I like, didn't even know that was Dwight Yoakam. And he's obviously a big country singer and he was absolutely menacing in panic room. What a great, uh, great turn that is. Um, all right. Your, your, your other one, Derek, I'm just going to say, uh, boy state track down boys state on Apple TV I thought that was a very, very interesting documentary. And then, of course, Class Action Park on HBO Max. Also terrific. We're going to end the show with a rumor of the week, and it's a big one. And it's a big spoiler. So if you do not want to be spoiled about Bo Rat 2, turn off the podcast now. I'm just going to end it after this rumor of the week. I'm going to wrap it up, say goodbye, and all that. So if you're listening right now, you want to be spoiled about a big cameo in, in Bo Rat 2. And here it goes. I've heard that Borat 2 ends with a major reveal, a Kaiser Soze-esque reveal. Because like, I think that it involves Kazakhstan sending Borat to the U.S. to spread COVID. And so I believe at the end of the movie, from what I've heard, we're going to see none other than Oscar winner, two-time Oscar winner, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is going to show up at the end of Borat 2, and I believe someone's going to cough on him. And that is going to sort of bring the whole thing full circle, as if to imply that Borat, or whoever is doing the coughing, gave it to Tom Hanks and let America's nice guy spread the disease in this country. That'll do it. I've got a whole bunch more on Borat 2, but uh, you know, I certainly don't want to spoil uh, too much about that movie. Don't know when we're going to see it. I still think it'll be out before the election, but uh, yeah, stay tuned on that front. Anyways, that'll do it for episode 50 of the Snyder Cut. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Go Celtics. Brutal loss on Tuesday night. Brutal loss. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Cameo, all that good stuff. Take care.